Welcome everybody to another Casio Live Artist Spotlight. My name is Mike Martin. Thanks for joining us today. As always, we'll be taking your comments and questions live. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, we can see everything you're saying. So join in the conversation. Today we've got a great guest. But first, I gotta welcome my co-host to joining me once again, 820 miles to the east. Mr. Rich Formadoni, how are you, Rich? Doing pretty good. Things are just peachy over here in the Garden State. We are safe at home, and fortunately, we've got plenty of great music to listen to, like that of our fine guest today. Awesome. So, yeah, it's going to be a real pleasure. We've, I've known Anthony for a very long time, and now everybody can see my, my green screen is live. My beautiful brick wall disappeared, but I'll get that fixed up here in just a minute. <laughs> so, first, let me That's just good. introduce our guest uh, he's an amazing concert pianist. Uh, he's been an artist in residence at Alma University in uh, Central Michigan, and he's been a Casio yard artist for over 10 years. Uh, he was once upon a time my roommate, uh, one of my best friends, played at my wedding, uh, and also joined Casio as our education consultant recently. Welcome to the broadcast, Anthony Patterson. Great to have you here. Hi, guys. There we go. Thanks great. for joining us today, man. Good to have you. It's great to be here. This is awesome. <laughs> Greetings from northern Michigan. <laughs> wow. How is it up there? It's beautiful. We had a beautiful day, about 72 and sunny, and no tornadoes. We had one last week, but it's no longer here. Wow. <laughs> I think any day without tornadoes is probably a good day in I perspective. Complete. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Anthony, thanks thanks so much for joining us. And looks like we've got uh, people joining in on both Facebook and YouTube as we talk here. So awesome. Awesome. So I'm just dealing with technical difficulties over on my end real quick. There we go. Uh, just to answer uh, Walter Williams, he asked, do I get to ask any question? Yes, you do. But unfortunately, you only get to ask one. So that was it. Um, <laughs> no, please feel free. Jump in. Ask whatever questions you need. Uh, Joe's saying he thought I was at the office. Yes, I'm coming to you live from a photo that I took of Casio's headquarters in Tokyo. So it's a little bit more interesting than my blinds, which you've been watching for the past few episodes. <laughs> yes, we're all going with virtual backgrounds today using you know, modern technology when it works. So, uh, yeah, Ex fun, fun experiments in technology today. So, yep. um, so Anthony, we normally ask everybody how they get started playing music and I know in your case it was with because of your dad who's an amazing pianist yeah. himself um did you ever think of doing anything else or was it always going to be music <laughs> it's always it has always been uh music uh for some reason I always think about uh the Anne Rice interview with a vampire you know I'm going to give you the choice I was never given. Huh. My dad, uh, <laughs> he was a jazz pianist <laughs> and uh, uh, Lima, Ohio. Uh, his kind of claim to fame, both him and my piano teacher, who was my Uncle Don, were the jazz uh, band leaders in Lima, Ohio. And they both uh, discovered classical music at the same time. Uh, so this is the 50s third wave of jazz, everybody was kind of, there was this mingling between classical and jazz. And then I came along in the early 60s and they wanted, they both worked on making me a classical pianist. And that was, and luckily it was intrinsic because I certainly was forced to practice. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit, but it paid off. I mean, by the time you were Eight years old, I think you were playing with the Lima Symphony Orchestra. Uh, what what was that like? I mean, being so young. Well, um, it was it was kind of scary, but I was going to get some GI Joes afterwards. So, <laughs> for those of you of a certain age, this would have been Life Like Hair and Kung Fu Grip GI Joes. So not the plastic ones, but they oh yeah. Really tall ones big ones and so that was what i was looking forward to it's a mozart uh piano concerto written for uh you know by mozart when he was a young kid with small hands and 
Uh, I played it with the Lima Symphony, then toured it to all the local high schools and, and junior high schools, and that was that was interesting. It was really interesting. <laughs> wow. And, um, by the way, uh, hi, Ray, who's saying hi to us on, uh, on YouTube there. Uh, Anthony, we just debuted your latest co-op COVID opus piece. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about what led you to write these pieces and, and what the inspiration was? Well, uh, okay. So we said that I, I'm the, the Casio EDU consultant and I've been a fan of, it really does come down to that. I've been a fan of the uh, uh, Privia line, of course, Grand Hybrid, now Casio Tone, but the Privia line blew me away. And, and this goes back to before Mike and I were roommates, when we first met, I was playing some gig with what's called a uh, Rhodes Suitcase uh, Piano. EP, and I got so fed up with it that I left it at a gig because it it said suitcase. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. Come on, you get the. I know, I know. I get it. it. Is it still there? Where is it? I just just blew the air horn. Still there (laughs) in in Athens, Ohio, and uh, (laughs) it weighed what three hundred pounds? Could have weighed three hundred pounds. I know, I know. It, it wasn't hurts, Mike. It hurts. I know. So when I when I discovered the, uh, uh, I think the first uh, privy I had was PX three thirty. Yeah. And I was blown away that something could weigh under twenty six pounds, and have an action that I could play anything I wanted to on it. I mean, anything. So. We start to get into quarantine. Uh, my uh, job at Alma, I was getting ready to retire from my job at Alma, and then everything shut down. And we, Kate, my, my wife um, is a professor at the University of Illinois. We bought a house in Champaign. So I moved down there and we're cooped up. So that kind of worked out. I decided to try to uh, come up with compositions. Uh, My wife was very supportive of of, uh, my compositional uh, endeavors. And I thought, man, so we got a PXS 3000. And the sample is so wonderful. And I thought, this sample is going to match the seven foot concert Steinway that my dad picked out in 1959 that was made in 1956. It was an artist piano, so it had toured. And who knows who played it for those three years. He went to New York and picked it out. I grew up on it. I spilled orange juice in it. The stain (laughs) is still there. My dad's still not, it's still not something we can joke about. And that's... (laughs) That's about 50 years, 40, 50 years ago. So I thought, if I can write some pieces that show how this piano that weighs 24 pounds can match this seven-foot Steinway, uh, that would be neat and it would be really fun. So I started with uh, COVID Opus 1 and realized that I had to write 18 more. <laughs> so that's how they started and then with two i thought typically right now i'd be in the middle of a music festival i i've been teaching at the bayview music festival in uh, petoskey michigan or bayview michigan for the last 35 years i came as a student in 86 my wife came as a student in 93 we were friends and and uh were married 10 years ago and Mike was there at that wedding. Yes, I was. <laughs> She's a brilliant player as well. She's amazing. She's amazing. And so that adds a, a little bit of incentive <laughs> to make the parts good. Because if they're not good, she'll I'm t- she'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did one, uh, which is very Russian. <laughs> and two, I wanted to 
kind of make it a little lighter and and I have friends that aren't performing so I asked them if they'd like to be part of it and uh, it was uh, us. Kristen Holritz, Josh Holritz, uh, both from uh, Nashville, well no, from the Chattanooga Symphony but they both perform at that place they do studio work where we did that round table thing ocean view oh okay oh that's right yeah and then one of casey's friends from college g g young shim anderson and uh professor from uh, Air, uh university of arizona philip alejo uh we would all be performing this summer and they agreed to do it and that was fun that was great so it then became more of a co-op, you know, and that's nice. that's kind of the idea. So many meanings. <laughs> exactly. So well, they're, they're beautiful pieces, and I like the uh, individual personality of each one. Um, who are some of your favorite composers? Who are the composers that influenced your, your writing style the most? Well, there are three that, oh, no, let's say five. Let's say five started me out. And, and not to leave out Brahms, Poulenc, uh, Samuel Barber, who I love, but starting out, one of my f earliest memories of loving a piece was um, Petrushka by Stravinsky. Mm. I love I love Russian music. I love Shostakovich, but Stravinsky, Petrushka, my dad told me a story about it. I used to listen to it when I was a little kid. I just absolutely loved it. That's beautiful. Then Rhapsody in Blue. Uh -huh. I saw the movie uh, with Robert Alda, which is extremely Hollywood version of uh, Gershwin's life. But, um, man, I fell in love with it so much that the next morning I was playing it on my dad's uh, stereo system where he had an electro voice uh, speakers that were huge and i think i blew his speakers at 7 30 in the morning because i could still see his face <laughs> sorry like I, you didn't treat your father's musical stuff very well growing up <laughs> well yeah only child i did everything <laughs> it's it's a little funnier if you know his dad so I, i'm i'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Richard Patterson is my dad's name, and he's quite something. He's really funny. But he had, he had a, um, this is, I'm, I'm going off script, but um, he had a piano store as well, right? He had a piano in, store, Baldwin Piano Store in uh, Tiffin, Ohio, Finley, Ohio, and then in Lima, Ohio. He had a, a competition at that store called the Little Carnegie Competition that drew in people from... Cleveland Institute of Music to the University of Indiana, I mean, IU, Cincinnati Conservatory, all those prep schools were coming up and doing this competition. And it, it, it got pretty uh, big and, and um, really competitive. There were some great pianists who came to the store. But you won by default, is that correct? I never, I, I was never <laughs> in that because that would have been, that would have been, <laughs> but you did compete later on. Oh, I did a and number it, of competitions. Yeah, Amer American Meta uh, American Federation of Music Clubs. I came in third in the nation. Um, as with many pianists, I started off as a classical pianist, uh, concert pianist, and then moved into becoming a collaborative pianist. My wife is a collaborative pianist as well. And right about at the end of being a uh, concert pianist I did this competition and uh, it was it was great it was great and then after that I moved on to being a collaborative pianist which has been awesome chamber music is incredible oh. all right so I interrupted your earlier question we were at Rhapsody in Blue you got three more okay three more so then I discovered um, I think I got my first stereo system it was an EV amp that I eventually blew and that's when I realized that smoke smell for the first <laughs> time 
and realize that you you just can't you know cross the wires. Uh, <laughs> but oh, man. I had a Gerard turntable, I remember, and that there was a it was not one of the original Beatles albums, but it was their love songs, and I fell in love with their love songs in the way that uh, George Martin scored the strings. Just I love. I love that. So the Beatles, and then you, you'll notice there's a theme here. Everything has to do with technology and music, because so I had an eight-track tape player <laughs> that I was powering with a model train uh, amplifier. I mean, model train uh, power supply. Wouldn't be a power supply transformer, transformer, and uh, Queen's first album so this is the red album named queen with uh um seven seas of rye or something like that and all these all the songs that they had been doing kind of before and during the beginning of freddie mercury's tenure with the group and i just absolutely fell in love with it that and then you know uh, night at the opera Actually, obviously Bohemian Rhapsody, but the Prophet song. Absolutely love the Prophet song from that album. And then I've got one more, right? You got one more. Beethoven. All right. Beethoven. Uh, I could have gone to Vangelis because <laughs> he's an I don't really, but uh, it has it has to be Beethoven um, because. It's just Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> no explanation. No explanation. Yeah, exactly. So I thought you were in one of those five. I thought you might throw in um, a newer one. I thought you might mention John Williams because I know he's a favorite of, of ours. And yeah. it also gives me an opportunity to play an arrangement that you did of some John Williams music for piano. So this is an arrangement called John Williams in 2 minutes and 30 seconds. This particular take goes about two minutes and 40, but we'll, we'll let it slide. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs>
And we're back. Anthony, that's absolutely an amazing arrangement. Just I I love it. You you played it at NAM a number of times as well. Uh, I every every time we're together, I'm like, "Can you play it again?" <laughs> I just <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's so, just so well put together. So, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, play, so, play it again. so number 7 has to be John Williams. I I I'm sorry that he wasn't included in the 5 or 6. Yeah. John Williams is is amazing. <laughs> nice. Ruth Ann Greenberg is saying hello, everyone. That was beautiful. Uh, Tim Paul, hey Tim, great medley arrangement. Hey Tony, tell us about you and your wife duetting with a hybrid and a concert grand. That was the uh, the COVID opus piece. Uh, or is there another one you might be thinking of? We did uh, we did a concert at Alma. So. One of the gigs that I've had is uh, through um, a ballet producer in uh, um, Philadelphia. I've done a number of albums for her for ballet class. And it's given me a chance to compose and recently orchestrate for a small chamber ensemble. Alma, uh, my home college, and up here at Bayview hired Casey and me to do um, those ballet pieces for two pianos. And so one of those concerts was with a Steinway D, nine foot, and a Grand Hybrid, and that was awesome. I mean, nice. the idea that you don't have to have a second uh, nine foot concert grand and you, we could do that is just incredible. Great question. And again, everybody, we're, we're watching the comments. So if you have questions for Anthony, please, please bring them in. So, uh, Rich, why don't you take the next one? Because he kind of covered some of the ballet uh, questions that I was going to ask. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, you have, in addition to the, the ballet experience, you also have extensive experience playing with touring Broadway shows like Wicked and The Color Purple. Uh, what is the stress level like? <laughs> <laughs> on a Broadway stage or below a Broadway stage compared to other kinds of performances? Well, uh, as in not being part of the touring group, but being a sub or coming in and doing a whole week, uh, the pressure is this. Imagine if you are being asked to do something that is extremely difficult, that lasts for two and a half hours, and you're performing it for someone who's done it 679 times and you're replacing that person and that person sits there during the first run through, which is the final dress rehearsal. Uh, and that person is reading a book and they're reading this book. And if you make a mistake, he looks up from the book and he says, bar 39, you need to check out bar 39. <laughs> so it's, it's as a sub, typically what you'll do is, and, and it's, it's, like going to the office, you'll have uh, your music, which is usually a tricky thing in itself because that music is more meant not for pianists. It's not in a binder or anything like that. It's usually in large uh, cardstock uh, with multiple folds in it. Now, that works really well for a saxophonist or a flutist or even the guitarist, but we have multiple page turns. Then you have one pedal that is volume and one pedal that is patch change and one pedal is a sustain, but forget about the sustain. If you get to get to over to the sustain, that's cool. <laughs> then you have this music that isn't necessarily that difficult, but my first show after a hiatus of about 15 years of doing these shows, and let me tell you, it changed a lot, um, was uh, Legally Blonde, which had 476 patch changes. So that the patch change adds a brand new syncopation to the piece because you might be doing a patch change in between two pieces, you know, I mean, right. two, two uh, lines of music and I'm telling you and, and back then so this is also the way we use main stage so color uh, I mean Legally Blonde used main stage right. 
That was main stage one. <laughs> so they could only hold a hundred and some patches in a particular concert. Uh, uh, concert. Yeah. So <laughs> you finish that, you might be in the middle of a piece. You're, you have 27 bars till, uh, you know, 27 bars till the next load in. And so you start it loading in. Well, Computers get to show their randomness in the weirdest places, and load time is really one of those weird places. So sometimes we'd make it, sometimes I wouldn't be able to hit the uh, cabasa. And, you know, they made mapping things all. It was, it was really interesting. Um, and one story comes from Shrek, uh, which was an easy show up until the last piece and then it was really difficult there was a patch change that i had to do now these are these broadway shows have markings in them these are the original scores so they crossed out all this section and they said you got to hit the patch change twice this is for an entrance for farqua all right <laughs> right and so <laughs> if you don't hit it twice instead of playing a brass fanfare you're going to be playing the fart sound. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they told me afterwards, because I, I did not make the patch change, they said everybody messes that up and everybody plays the fart sound. And what was funny is everyone in the pit was watching me. They were waiting, waiting for this for to it. happen. <laughs> yeah, it. It did. It's interesting. Oh, that's great. Uh, Another Casio employee, Mark Emmett, played played bass on that show uh, when it was in Philadelphia. Oh wow! And he he did not enjoy it. And Mark's an amazing player, an amazing amazing yeah. reader, which you have to be for those shows. But he did not enjoy it at all. <laughs> He's like, Mike, this is all like cartoon music. I'm like, Yep. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different. It's a it's different music, and it's part of the and i love that show uh, my son was in that show as well once upon a time so anyway we digress um <laughs> so thanks i'm looking at the uh i'm oh, sorry go ahead uh i was just looking at the comments we've got a, a hello from dina perlman of the alan r perlman foundation hi dina thank you very much for stopping by uh ruth ann uh, greenberg is asking tony what is your favorite uh piano patch on the casios do you have a favorite of any of the the specific models? Oh boy, that's that's tricky. Um, Cap Mark just said I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I got that story right, Mark, but I remember you didn't. Says it. I never did a pit gig since. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I know you didn't like it. I just couldn't remember that story exactly. So anyway, Grand Hybrid. Uh, Three patches are, are what? Because I may call them something wrong. What the Berlin, we... Hamburg, and Vienna? Mm -hmm. I'm kind of, I kind of like the Berlin a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, on the PXS 3000 that we have at home, we're just using the, uh, is it called just Grand Piano? It's Concert uh, Grand, no. yeah. Just the, concert, the default concert. concert Grand. I'm pretty sure what you use most of the time. Yeah, yeah, and I, I love it. I mean, there's a number of reasons why it it does well for me. Um, realized that when I was writing these pieces, um, initially, you know, I didn't know how the PXS 1000, uh, 3000 was going to work with the Steinway Grand. Um, and I thought it would be incredible. The real uh, uh, success of that sample is that I can play any articulation at any range of the piano, so much so that initially, you know, I would write this part for Casey. Casey was going to be on the PXS 3000. I was going to be on the Concert Grand. And... Um, it 
got to the point where we didn't really need to, she didn't need to be on piano one and I didn't need to be on piano two. So we're, we're switching them back and forth to match what we, you know, what uh, is our uh, strengths as pianists, as, as whatever, whatever we like to play. And I thought, man, this is, I mean, we're not, we were not thinking that we're on a piano and a keyboard, which is, <laughs> And along those lines, let me let me tell you also that we're in quarantine, so the piano tuner hasn't been able to come out to the house. Uh, <laughs> and so the Steinway is starting to, it sounds great now, but it sounds like, I don't know, the Abbey Road's sample of the piano that they had there. It's starting to sound a little bit, it's starting to go south. And so we almost have to put the the singing uh, lines in the Casio because it sounds better in some ways right awesome. now. So that's a great time to listen to Co-op 3, your, your latest composition, which again has your Steinway, uh, the PXS 3000, as well as a host of others. So let's take a, a listen to that.
And we're back. Absolutely oh. amazing piece. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. So, yeah, that gives you an idea of how how the PXS and the Steinway just blend together so well. And I love at moments, uh, as we were discussing while I was playing, just how lyrically the, the PXS 3000 is, is just absolutely gorgeous. Well, it helps that my wife uh, <laughs> so lyrically. Beautiful, beautiful uh, musician. Uh, Mark was asking a question and I had some comments in there. He said, bravo, Anthony, Casey. Um, seriously, wonderful playing and composition. He says, love the way it builds. Will there be a CD? Are you going to release these? Sure. Sure. I think I think we will, especially if I make it to 19, I'm going to release them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I come up with that number, but that's it. <laughs> oh, man. Awesome. So uh, another question from Tim Paul coming in. He says, um, whichever hybrid piano voice you choose, whether it be the Berlin, Hamburg, or Vienna, do you color it in any way to suit your preferences or you just use the default settings? I, I, so far, I'm just using the default settings um, because at this point, in my opinion, and each setting really is a complete different universe because they're three different pianos. And they, you know, if I go to uh, a piano on stage, every one is different and, and you All right, so it looks like Rich had a connection issue, so it's just me. So um, what what made you want to get involved in music education? Well, um, part of uh, the process of going to school, uh, getting involved in um, studying in school, is a lot of your friends, a lot of your uh colleagues that you meet are in school and then jobs open up that way and that's that's kind of how it happened for me i i love the process of making music almost as much as i love the experience of playing music so colleges uh, music festivals uh, these are places where we really spend a lot of time working on process and I, I love process. I love the process of making music. That's awesome. Well, we met. Oop. I lost your audio there for a second at the end. You still there? Just double checking? I am okay. here. <laughs> All right. We're experiencing some weird delays. Internet, internet phenomenon is happening. Um, so what do you say to people? And I think uh, these pieces are a great example. Um, your co-op pieces what do you say to people who are skeptical about using digital instruments as opposed to acoustic instruments in in music education well you know one of the great things about the grand hybrid is it mimics a grand piano action with a, a full fulcrum action and what i mean by that is the key is is long enough so that the uh the place where it uh, pivots is far enough back that you can play deep into the keys. Now, when you play the piano, you're not just playing on the white notes and then the black notes, you're playing in there, in between. If you see a, a concert piano sounds, they are making use of the shortest distance between two places. And many times it's not moving your arms out and in. And so, that's the grand hybrid. That is like having a grand piano. That is uh, going to teach you um, how to play a grand piano. Now, what I've always loved about every privia that I've had is the key bed. I, with my students, with uh, my teachers, uh, we've always spoken about arm weight. Being able to sink into a key without moving your hand very much. And 
the key bed in all of the Cassios across the board is really, really uh, good for, you know, Mike and I share uh, a teacher, a guy named yeah. Richard Syracuse. Yeah. <laughs> and when Richard Syracuse would play the piano, I always felt like he was like shaping clay. Right. His hands were so close to the keys and wouldn't be moving much. And that's, I think, key bed. And that's something that uh, you can teach arm weight on any Casio 88 note weighted keyboard. Um, you can also just about play any accompaniment pattern, which is a feat. Mm -hmm. That is, and definitely something that is necessary to be able to teach uh, how to play the piano. So for people who are skeptical about using, or teachers who are skeptical about using keyboards, I can speak from experience that I can practice on a Privia, go out to uh, nine, foot con nine foot concert grand on piano and be prepared to play it. Yep. Answers the question perfectly. A um, couple more and then we'll wrap up. Um, are there any other like trends you're seeing in music education as a result of the pandemic? Uh, you know, obviously a lot of things are happening online or do you have any advice to music educators during this time? Well, um, it, it has been difficult for us. It has been difficult for, uh, private teachers, uh, one of the things that I've done as the educational consultant for Casio is work with some of these uh, schools, festivals, uh, to get keyboards to their students at home. Students, not all students have a, a piano or a grand piano in their front room. They have been relying on practicing in, in uh, uh, practice rooms. Right. They've spent their entire educational career uh, using someone else's keyboard. So one of the things that schools are doing is they are now offering, uh, some schools are offering the ability to either rent or they're providing students with keyboards at home so that uh, they can do their uh, online meetings uh, with a keyboard at home and this is not just pianists um, every student has to every music student in the country has to pass their piano proficiencies whether you're a sax player or a trumpet player or singer you have to be able to play the piano because all of or most of our music is based on a keyboard right um, so they're doing that and then even uh voice students need to have something that they can pluck out their parts with so that they can maybe uh take a lesson a virtual lesson i mean the the, the biggest problem we're having right now is the lag so we're not really able to have a good collaboration for ensembles yeah that's that's tricky there are some solutions that are getting better there are some that that reduce it quite a bit but for larger ensembles it's still pretty challenging right now yeah yeah but for but for certainly individual education with with zoom which will even do nice stereo audio and and uh, the technology that's out there you know, frankly it's it, it's pretty remarkable where we're at all things considered and as, as you said Instruments like Privias or even instruments like um, our new CDP pianos, which are even less expensive but share some of the same attributes as far as the keyboard action, um, are great, great solutions for music educators right now. Right. And the Casio tone. Man, that Casio. <laughs> those, those, they're, they're amazing fun and uh, CTX, which I have over here. <laughs> yeah. for sound effects well, well we, let's just let's just talk about one of the first times that we met i carried a keyboard 
a 61 note keyboard yep. halfway across campus and that keyboard weighed 60 pounds yep. 61 notes and now <laughs> you have a keyboard that weighs what 7.23 pounds yeah mm-hmm. yeah and it's 61 notes touch sensitive and it's got a usb interface on it right that's crazy it's crazy that's- yes i do remember back when we met and i had uh my Commodore 64 computer and uh, <laughs> you retrofitted? yeah, well, yeah, I had MIDI on my Commodore 64, but uh, I always compare this to the uh, the movie Amadeus, where where Mozart makes fun of Salieri. Um, I you came over to my dorm or my apartment at the time, and I had at the time a, a pretty sophisticated keyboard rig and a computer and went over and after everything turned on and warmed up <laughs> all the floppies <laughs> finished loading i hit space bar and this composition that i had spent months on played and then you sat down and played it back for me and kind of laughed oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't it be great if you did it this way it would be better <laughs> so that was my um, that story <laughs> sticks in my brain just a little bit because you have you have perfect pitch uh it's an incredible talent to have and uh that's i mean i guess here's a question how do you deal with uh, out of tune instruments when when you have perfect pitch my goodness well i played string instruments for long enough for that not to bother me so much (laughs) oh my goodness (laughs) I, I, did you hear the extra laugh in the background? Casey's Casey, laughing. Yep, Casey's laughing. <laughs> uh, so one more question from, uh, looks like, uh, YouTube. Who are your favorite classical pianists? Not composers, classical pianists. Well, when I was growing up, um, uh, as I understood it, <laughs> as it was presented to me, they were either, you either were a Rubenstein family or a Horowitz family, and we were definitely a Rubenstein family. So Arthur Rubenstein was my favorite pianist growing up. Um, he, uh, oh my goodness, I saw him uh, right at the end of his life uh, in Cincinnati, and it was it was amazing. He was just such such a poet. And then uh, years later, I I. Uh, really loved the uh, Earl Wild. I, I actually loved his Chopin and loved his. He had a beautiful, elegant Mephisto Waltz. Mm, I love that piece. And he, I studied with him at OSU, and that was that was awesome. That was really quite something. He was a, a great jazz pianist. He could make a piano sound like three different instruments using the sustenuto pedal. It was really amazing. And Glenn Gould, Glenn Gould, I love. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Hammond just, just commented, Gould. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Well, Anthony, thank you for spending this time with us today. And your, your the compositions that you've been doing during this time, just absolutely amazing. Um, and we look forward to, so you've got three down. I know number four is in the works. I and, have number four. And so you have 14 more. <laughs> well, I'll tell you so far, four is going to be hopefully with a good friend of mine and <laughs> uh, a cello player who's doing pretty well uh, as a, as a uh, rock cello, I guess, singer. He's really quite something. Five, six, and seven will be preludes. Eight, nine, and ten may be a trumpet concerto for two pianos and trumpet. We'll see. All right. I like that you've got a roadmap for all of this. Well, we look forward to to hearing more. So um, they're absolutely amazing. So do release them. Do publish them. Do release a, a CD so people can enjoy them further. So great idea but i guess with that being said anthony thank you so much for spending this hour with us um if you guys want to check out um anthony more um 
we do have a, a music education page at Casio.com. I'll be as, there's going to be a contact form added there. So if you, you need help from Casio Music Education World for your, your school, your high school, your college, uh, that's one way to get in touch with Anthony directly. And we will all uh, from Casio be there to help and support you. So, uh, But Anthony, take care of yourself. Give our best to Casey and look forward to uh, seeing your next composition and seeing you soon. Great, Mike. Thank All right. you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. Take care and see you next time. If you like this content, please like or subscribe and share. And for Casio and Rich, who dropped out somewhere during the middle of this, thanks, everyone, and see you next time. Take care.